I want to pick up uh, in discussing John the Baptist from last week. Um, you will discover in this series that I'm doing with you that I will uh, continue in the text uh, from episode to episode. So uh, it might be good to have your Bible with you when you're looking at this, uh, because I'm not going to leave any word of God out. I'm going to let you uh, appreciate the, the value of every word that is there. So let me read something that I am determined that you will see. John the Baptist is speaking to the leadership and uh, Matthew only names the Sadducees and the Pharisees. I want to tell you something small about the Sadducees because we only meet them uh, very occasionally in the gospel, but we do meet them at very significant moments. Uh, the name came from Sedekah, which means righteousness. So the Tzedekim were the holy ones. Okay. These men were called the holy ones and they are presented in the gospel. And Jesus' response to them is that they're anything but holy. They're actually, by the time uh, the gospel begins, they're actually a corrupt priesthood. Uh, and it's actually very sad. Um, they were fundamentalists as well. Uh, if something wasn't actually written down in the Old Testament, they wouldn't believe it. So in the final confrontations in Matthew's Gospel between Jesus and the uh, Sadducees, you're going to hear Jesus telling them that they are very much wrong in the way that they are interpreting Scripture. That Scripture has these four different levels uh, and it's, it's not meant to be a, a literalist uh, uh, interpretation as if that's the only level that's there. And Jesus said to them that God implied the resurrection in simply telling Moses back in uh, Exodus 3 that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We'll deal with that down the road. Okay, so these Sadducees um, were in a power struggle with the Pharisees uh, to try and control the people. They were two of the main groups that were actually in the Sanhedrin. Uh, they had huge influence. Uh, they had, at the time we're talking about, they had more influence than the, the, the Pharisees themselves. They were very wealthy. They were the political elite. They were very worldly and they were the sworn enemies of Jesus. From the very beginning, when they're presented in chapter two, they're the sworn enemies of Jesus. They're always on the opposite side to the side that Jesus is on. Therefore, John the Baptist does not accept that the, they're coming with any sincerity towards him. And when you come down to the other end of the gospel in chapter 21, verse 43, Jesus will tell them, the kingdom of God is taken from you and is given now to a people who will bear its fruit. So that was the final judgment of Jesus on this corrupt priesthood. And of course, once that judgment was given, the temple was going to come down and the whole system was going to fall. In the arguments between uh, uh, John the Baptist and these uh, elites, they would say, but we have Abraham for our father. Now, if you've read John's gospel, this all comes up in John chapter eight. We are the children of Abraham. And uh, John the Baptist says something to them that you will hear St. Paul picking up in his letter to the Galatians and his letter to the Romans. And that is that mere descent from Abraham does not guarantee you a place in the kingdom of God. Uh, just as mere baptism does not guarantee you or me a place either, you have to actually live the life. You have got to live a life of holiness. You've got to actually do God's will. In other words, you have to live as a child of God if you want to go to God's heaven. Now, this issue of living as a child of God is going to be the subject of chapter four. That's why it's brought up here uh, and why you can't uh, miss any uh, point uh, that that is made because the, the gospel writer builds up his theme just like you would build up a jigsaw puzzle, putting each one of the, the pieces in its place. So. He said, don't start boasting that you're children of Abraham because he said, and this is verse nine, chapter three, verse nine. 
I tell you that God can raise children for, from, for Abraham from these stones. Now, most people pass on and they don't stay and ask the question, what is significant about these stones? So I told you the place where John the Baptist was operating was very significant, and now I'm going to tell you why. When you go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 4, you will find that where John the Baptist is actually working was the place where the tribes of Israel crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. And God worked a mighty miracle for them in the Jordan by piling up the waters of the Jordan on either side for them. And the Ark of the Covenant was held by the priests in the middle of the Jordan until all the people passed through. The Ark of the Covenant held the presence of God. We're coming to it. Jesus is on his way. When the people passed through safely, Joshua insisted on 12 stones, memorial stones, being left in the riverbed as a memory. Now, when the river is in flood, nobody would know. But when the water level goes down, and it was obviously down at the time when John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing, John could stand on the stones to baptize people in the riverbed. So when he says that God will raise up children uh, for Abraham from these stones, he's telling them that a completely new people of God is going to be raised up because the new Moses is on his way and he is coming and he will stand on these stones and the heavens will open and he will open a completely new way of redemption for all the children of God. So these stones are incredibly important. It's the, it's the place where this incredible fulfillment is going to take place. There's another message with regard to the stones and that is that John the Baptist is saying it would take a mighty miracle from God to change the stony hearts of these scribes and Pharisees, and it didn't happen. The other thing about the stones is that the attitude that these leaders had towards the Gentiles was that they were stones, meaning stone dead, that spiritually there was no hope. If you go to St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 you'll hear that the Gentiles were outside of the promises they were outside of the covenant they were outside of the blessings they were outside of Abraham they were outside of everything without hope and without God they were stone dead and John the Baptist is hinting at something Jesus is going to do which is to raise up a Gentile church something that was inconceivable in the minds of these, this leadership absolutely inconceivable. So the stones are important. But one of the things, if you knew the language, knowing the language is actually quite helpful because in the, the Hebrew authors love playing with words. They absolutely love doing it. And uh, the word for stones is abnea and the word for children is benea. So it was very easy to, to switch from one to the other uh, in talking about them. So, John the Baptist uh, goes on to give them a very solemn warning that comes straight out of Malachi that I've, I spoke about in our last episode. And that is, I'll read it for you. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who follows me is more powerful than I am. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, somebody who could only baptize with water, that is very limited because the water is limited to a sign on your body. And only if you repent will there be any sign inside. But someone who can literally immerse you in the third person of the Blessed Trinity, immerse you in divine love, immerse you in this incredible love of the Trinity descending upon us. He's powerful. And he adds, and fire. Now I've met many, many people who claim to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and I say to them, well, what about the fire? Did you get the fire yet? The fire makes all the difference. Because the Holy Spirit, uh, we have this strange idea that the Holy Spirit is a dove 
and people often use the symbol of the dove for the Holy Spirit, we're going to have this problem in the baptism of Jesus, which I will explain. The Holy Spirit's no dove. He's fire from God. How did he come down on the apostles and Blessed Mother on Pentecost Day? He came down as fire, galvanizing them to get up and go and do something. The Holy Spirit isn't a dove just sitting on you looking pretty. Not at all. And you will know if you've had the Holy Spirit because you will have been galvanized to get up and do something for Christ. The Holy Spirit is absolutely on the side of Christ. But if you're sitting on the fence saying this preacher is good, bad or indifferent or this uh, missionary is good, bad or indifferent, mm -mm, the fire hasn't hit you. If you have received the fire, you will know. And I'll read the rest before I explain it. This is verses 11 and 12. The one who comes after me is more powerful than I am. I am not fit to carry his sandals. So there's John the Baptist acknowledging that Jesus coming after him belongs to a different sphere altogether. John the Baptist is the man of earth. Jesus is the man from heaven. Okay. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, verse 12 is very important. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and he will gather the wheat in his barn, but the chaff he will throw into a fire that will never end. Now, here we have the anticipation of the parable of the wheat and the darnel in chapter 13. And the wheat and the darnel are separated in the end and the darnel is burnt. Okay. But John the Baptist has spoken about two different fires, the fire of the Holy Spirit and the other fire. So I'm going to call them good fire and bad fire because you're going to get one or the other. Make sure you choose. And the choice is ours. The good fire. If the Holy Spirit truly, genuinely comes into your life, this is what he will do. He cleanses, first of all, he purifies much deeper than cleansing. He sanctifies and he glorifies. They're the four things the Holy Spirit does. Check out, have you got them? If you don't have them, get them fast. If you never allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse, purify, sanctify and glorify, you'll be put into the other fire. And even though it never goes out, it's there eternally. It will never cleanse you. It will never purify you. It will never sanctify you and it cannot glorify you. That is tragedy beyond the word tragedy. And John the Baptist said, there's your future, choose. Choose. And one of the things that Matthew wants you to do all the time as you are not just reading his gospel, but taking every single word of it as the treasure that it actually is. He's saying, choose, you can choose your future. But if you ask the Holy Spirit to come, he's not going to sit on your head like a little dove and say, you're a nice little girl, you're really nice, you're grand, you're grand, you're grand. No, 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 no. There will be a radical purification of your life. And you will not be the person you were you will be a very different person. If you were selfish before, you will become loving. If you never served anybody before, you'll become the servant of the servants of God. That's what he does. That's what he makes people. You will be very different. John is telling us that if you don't go down this route, then unfortunately you will be part of the group where the reaper takes the winnowing fan in his hand and he does, he reaps the harvest and the good and the bad are separated. Now, when Matthew was writing this, of course, the ax was laid to the root of the trees in AD 70. Now, in those days, to cut a tree down, you put the ax to the root so that the whole tree came down. Okay, the whole tree came down AD 70 
to the year 100 and beyond. And so Matthew is very painfully remembering that this judgment has already been visited on Israel. And therefore the words of John the Baptist come across with great power and with great power and with great grace. When he says in verse 10, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees, you need to know that in the Old Testament, trees were a symbol of the people of God. And there's a very wonderful example of this if you want to check it out. I don't know if you have become a detective on the Bible yet. If you go back to the book of Judges, chapter 9, verses 7 to 15, you've got the wonderful uh, uh, poem that is called Jotham's Fable, in which the trees, which means the people of Israel, go out and ask the vine and the fig tree and the olive, will they become king? Will they sway over us? The trees are the people of God. Uh, and the vine and the, the fig tree and the olive were the great symbols of Israel to the point where there was even a model of the vine uh, before the Holy of Holies. Isn't it interesting? So when you read uh, Jesus saying, I am the vine, the people knew that the vine was a very special uh, symbol of the one who was actually to come. Okay. So let me just finish this particular section by reading two tiny bits from the prophets of the Old Covenant. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24, underlines this judgment that comes to those who refuse the refining fires of the Holy Spirit. He says, and on the way out, they will see the corpses of men who have rebelled against me. Their worm will not die and their fire will not go out and they will be loathsome to mankind. Now, the book of Revelation is very strong on this, okay? Uh, Zephaniah 1.18 says, neither their silver nor their gold have any power to save them. Now, the, the Jerusalem priesthood is going to find that out the hard way. They have all the power. They have the silver. They have the gold. They have everything. And they have nothing. So that's chapter three, uh, the first part of it. The second part of it is just pure treasure as well, because now Jesus arrives and stands where the Ark of the Covenant stood. The Ark of the Covenant held the presence of God, and this is the actual presence of God incarnate standing on these stones. No wonder the heavens opened, and for the first time in human history, the manifestation of the three divine persons was given on the earth. It's incredible. I'm going to be like the, the rich man who, who counts his coins slowly so that he really appreciates what he's doing. Matthew says, then Jesus appeared. Doesn't tell you anything that went on for the last 30 years. Doesn't tell you that Jesus has been on the road for weeks on the way to, to arrive just in time. Uh, and Jesus appeared means that he's arriving on the public stage. And from the moment he arrives on the public stage, drama breaks out and there will be huge drama because Jesus has an absolutely extraordinary effect on this nation. When you consider they had no telephones and no postal system, it's incredible the effect that this one life had on them all. Jesus appeared, he came from Galilee in the Jordan. Now don't forget that the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are present. Now, if somebody's going to claim to be a prophet, he's not going to come from Galilee. And you'll hear this in the arguments that are given later on. A prophet from Nazareth? Give us a break. It's bad enough that he comes from Galilee. Nazareth, the last place on the planet anybody would come from. And so Jesus is coming from the wrong direction, according to them. And he came to be baptized with John. So you have to ask the question, why, but why, but why would the Son of God come to be baptized? He's the only one who could ever say to the human race, can anyone convict me of sin? You'll find that in, in John's Gospel in chapter 8. Why has the sinless one come to stand there? Now he's standing in the right place because that's where the Ark of the Covenant stood, okay? Uh, the, the, the place is right. Why does he ask for baptism? Now, John the Baptist reacts to Jesus. He knows that Jesus doesn't need baptism. 
He knows who Jesus is. They've known each other since before they were born because we know from Luke's gospel that Jesus sanctified John in his mother's womb. But Matthew doesn't tell you that. Matthew keeps away from, from personal details. He only wants the public drama uh, of the redemption of mankind. So uh, John said, it is I who need baptism from you. Why are you asking me? And then Jesus' response is the beginning of his entire ministry. He said, leave it like this, he said, let us fulfill all righteousness. Now the big word in Matthew's gospel, and it is repeated over and over and over and over ad nauseam, is dikaiosine, righteousness. The whole issue is righteousness. These Sadducees who called themselves the righteous ones were full of corruption. And you'll hear that very clearly in Matthew 23. Oh, wow. When Jesus pulls back the veil on their corrupted lives, it's frightening. Jesus says, let us fulfill all righteousness. What does he mean? It means that as he steps into the Jordan, Jesus identifies himself completely with sinful humanity and he will repent in the name of Israel who refuses to repent. He will repent in the name of all human beings who refuse to repent. He will humble himself to be baptized in the name of all the millions who will refuse. He does it for them. He has come to literally live our lives in our place so that the grace is there at every single moment of our lives so that we can turn to him at any time, even if it's your last breath on your deathbed, you can still turn to him and all the grace is given. It's incredible. But this humility on the part of the Son of God God the Father can't take it. He opens the heavens and he said, excuse me, I want you to know this is my son. You are my own dear son. I am pleased with you. Only the Father can reveal his son. But Jesus was the only person on the planet who didn't mind somebody calling him a sinner when he was the saint of saints. And he was the origin of sanctity. He was sanctity itself. And the humility of somebody in that condition, uh, standing there, allowing everybody in the audience to think that he's a sinner who needs to repent, the humility of that is beyond our comprehension. And that's why it was at that moment, the heavens opened. I will continue this in our next episode. Thank you for listening. Slán agus bánach day live. Goodbye, God bless you. commercial-free, Catholic, charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, and God bless and prosper you. Shalom world, God's own channel.